Uh, it's been a few months since I've read this most recent book, so I'm sure we will not take the full allotted time. The effect of that is that uh, we'll be able to, to either send you to seminar early, or if the cause makes a weather call to dismiss you, we're waiting to see what he wants to do about that. Uh, the weather forecast for tomorrow morning looks particularly grim, so uh, I'm not a meteorologist, I don't play one on television, but I'm kind of guessing we'll be on a weather delay tomorrow morning. It uh, looks like quite a bit of snow and some rain on top of it. Uh, so uh, pay close attention to whatever weather notices you get. Um, we have arranged at least a couple of our speakers will be able to come to us by video teleconference. So uh, all is not lost. So in terms of travel, Brian Orend is already set up from Waterloo to uh, VTC in, and we've already tested the technology. Um, and we're working on that possibility with Dick Cohn. And failing that, Dick has given, will give me a written text and someone will present Dick's written remarks. And so we'll at least have his views represented. And, and uh, he was here last year. I know him pretty well. So I think I can reasonably, probably better speak for him than I can for Basevich. Um, but for this session, um, I want to at least lay out the gist of Andy's argument, and I'm going to proceed as if he were here to uh, tell you about him uh, in terms of the formal intro we prepared, and also to tell you about my friend and colleague Joel sitting next to me. So let me just read the intros I had prepared. Um, a retired Army officer, Andrew J. Basevich is Professor of International Relations and History at Boston University, a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, he received his PhD in American Diplomatic History from Princeton University. Before joining the faculty of Boston University, he taught at West Point and Johns Hopkins. In addition to his most recent book, Washington Rules, Bezovich is the author of The Limits of Power, The End of American Exceptionalism, The Long War, A New History of U.S. National Security Policy Since World War II, The New American Militarism, How Americans Are Seduced by War, and American Empire, The Realities and Consequences of U.S. Diplomacy. His essays and reviews have appeared in a variety of scholarly and general interest publications. His op-eds have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Boston Globe, and the LA Times, among other newspapers. In 2004, Dr. Basevich was a Berlin Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. He has also had fellowships at the Paul Nitze School of Advanced International Studies, the John F. Kennedy School of Government, and the Council of Foreign Relations. I would also add, by the way, that Andy's been giving a lot of book uh, talks about this most recent book, Washington Rules. Um, so if you're interested in his views, if you simply Google his name, you will find a lot of these presentations. I've listened to a very good one from the World Affairs Council of Northern California. So uh, if you have further interest in, and don't necessarily want to read the book, but want to get the gist of the argument, uh, those audio files are readily available to stream to listen to his views. Uh, to respond to them, uh, and he has a formal presentation prepared as if he were responding to Andy, is Dr. Joel Rosenthal on my right. As president of the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, one of Andrew Carnegie's original peace endowments, founded in 1914 to promote the principles of pluralism and peace, Dr. Joel Rosenthal sponsors educational programs for worldwide audiences. The Council's lectures, publications, and educational programs focus on issues relating to ethics and war, the global economy, and cultural difference. Dr. Rosenthal is editor-in-chief of the journal Ethics and International Affairs, which I mentioned this morning, and author of Righteous Realists. I would add, by the way, that, that Joel's website, which is ccea.org, Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Relations.org, has a vast repository of talks and speeches and documents that have been delivered at the council. They're um, situated right on the Upper East Side of New York, so anybody who's in New York can get to them easily, and everybody who's anybody in New York uh, or visiting New York uh, tends to come by the Carnegie Council at various points. So it's a, it's a, a vast resource of good information and, and useful resources. Dr. Rosenthal received his, Harvard his degree from Harvard University and his PhD from Yale. Among his professional, I guess he couldn't get to Chicago. Um, um, among his professional activities, he serves as senior fellow at the Stockdale Center at the U.S. Naval Academy, as, the, as an adjunct professor at New York University, chairman of the Bard College Globalization and International Affairs Program in New York City, and honorary, honorary professor in history at the University of Copenhagen. Please join me in welcoming Joel to the Naval War College. Uh, Bezovich's argument draws on something which we were talking about already this morning, which is um, the fact that we have allowed ourselves, uh, since World War II, 
to develop a vast uh, military force deployed all over the world. I mean, if you're, if you're not an American, if you're an American, step out of your own cultural skin for a moment and imagine the effect on anybody else at looking at one of those maps of the unified commands spanning the globe. Um, what other country in the world would have the audacity to, to carve up the globe into its unified commands uh, in the way that we do it? And the fact that we do it without embarrassment or even without particularly noting how bizarre that is, uh, Andy would say, is something we should really be thinking about, in particular for the reasons we were talking about in the first session this morning, that from the long historical point of view, um, our founders were very determined not to do this. Um, President Monroe said, we don't go seeking dragons to, to slay uh, out there. And, and it's true that Americans have always thought themselves exceptional in certain ways, and in, in some sense even an example to the nations. But for most of our history, the model was that we would communicate that by being some kind of moral and political exemplar, uh, not by the use of military force. Cause, uh, I see you're here. Do you, do you want to announce anything while we got you? Are, are we good till whenever the seminars end today? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so Andy, I think the subtitle of Andy's book is something like America's Path to Permanent War. Um, and uh, he points out that, uh, in fact, this is, uh, that the notion that we should be deployed all over the world and uh, interfering in affairs all over the world uh, is one that we've become quite accustomed to and actually generally consider unremarkable. Uh, and he points out that this is a consensus opinion that is largely unaffected by changes of party leadership in the country. Uh, and it's largely unquestioned by the media and political elites of the country, or even the academic elites of the country. So uh, he wants to challenge that consensus and say that uh, uh, perhaps we're, we're, uh, we have too much power for our own good. Uh, one of the reasons the founders didn't want a standing army was they were pretty convinced if you've got one, you'll use it. Um, one of the reasons that um, the Constitution so carefully divides the authority over the military as it does is that it felt comfortable making the president the commander-in-chief because in normal times he was commander-in-chief of basically nothing. Um, he would be the commander-in-chief of the Navy in, in normal peacetime because that would be all he had. Um, the, the National Guard, as we now call it, the militias would be working for the governors and there would be no standing army. Um, and so as, as the military has grown, so has what at various times we've called the imperial presidency. The idea that the, the president, re, again, regardless of party, could on his or her sole authority deploy military forces around the world. And uh, even a minimal thought at representative constitutional government will tell you that's not what the founders had in mind. Um, now, of course, as uh, Colonel Milburn's piece points out very, very well, uh, the fault for all this lies in a lot of places. I mean, the, the Congress has it in its power to reassert its authority, um, but it has not done so. Uh, as we all know, there has not been a declaration of war in the term intended by the Constitution since the Second World War. Uh, and after Vietnam, after there was a sense that maybe the, the power of the presidency had gotten too large in these matters, there was an attempt by the Congress to restrain the presidency a bit, called the Wars Powers Act of 1973, but uh, all presidents of both parties have held that this is unconstitutional and none of them have chosen to litigate it to the Supreme Court because, frankly, I don't think they want the answer. So where we've been left is with uh, a, a policy of permanent deployment, permanent engagement, uh, not to mention at vast expense, um, and with dubious results, uh, Andy would say. I'm trying to channel Andy as best I can here. Um, so none of these views necessarily are mine. I'm just trying to channel uh, Professor Vesevich. Um, but I think it's important for us to think about this because although it is not narrowly a, an issue of professional military ethics, uh, one of the questions you'll be thinking a lot about here is grand strategy. Uh, what do we think that we're trying to accomplish in the world and uh, with what means are we going to accomplish it? Um, as we were talking this morning, it's fairly obvious that even whether you think what we have been doing in the world with our military is good, bad, or indifferent, we're going to have a lot less of it in the near future. Um, the, the budget alone will drive a smaller force. Uh, that means we're going to have to think perhaps a lot harder than we've had to when we had uh, a, an embarrassment of riches uh, 
about where exactly we want to use it and for what purposes. And so I highly recommend Andy's book as a sort of very cold shower to, to say <laughs> you should really temper your aspirations, um, uh, my fellow Americans, to what you think you want to do in the world. And by the way, uh, you'd be better off if you spent some of this money on the economy and fixing up the infrastructure and doing a lot of other things. And as we mentioned this morning, one could do worse than revisit President Eisenhower's speech of 50 years ago. Or uh, a movie I would recommend to you, an excellent documentary, somewhat tendentious but still good, is called Why We Fight. Uh, did anybody see this recent documentary? Taking the name from the Frank Capra films of World War II, of course, that were intended to motivate people, but Why We Fight is a sort of Basevician reflection on um, how big the military is and how much it's become not only the military-industrial complex, but the military-industrial congressional uh, complex. Uh, because another fact that you have to consider is uh, congressmen of all political parties, when it comes to jobs in their district, are in favor of spending ever more money. Um, question, how many states are parts of the F-22 built in? 49. Um, so it takes a very unusual Secretary of Defense, like uh, Gates, to be willing to face down the political opposition to put any serious restraints on budgetary spending. And so what Andy is calling us to is to, to really question uh, at a deep level whether we ought to break this lockstep consensus, again, that spans the parties, that un is a, is, uh, spans our political debate. In fact, he would argue our political debate doesn't come anywhere near the central issue, um, and it really should start to do so. So, uh, Joel, add anything you like. If, uh, is that a fair statement of? Uh... Thank you, Martin. And I realize that my role here is to uh, add to the cold shower that <laughs> Professor Basevich wanted to, uh, to give you today. And I'll also, I will um, channel not only Professor Basevich, but President Eisenhower, uh, who gave his speech, I think, exactly 50 years ago um, about the military-industrial complex. But before I start, I just want to thank you, Martin, for this invitation. Um, as many of you may know, Martin has been a leader in this field of ethics and war and peace. Um, and I was delighted when you came here to the Naval War College, because I know that the college has been a important venue for discussions of ethics as it relates to the use of military force. And um, I, you know, when you invited me, I was really pleased to accept, so thank you. Um, I admire what all of you do, and I think it's important to have a venue like this where we can have an open discussion about very difficult issues. Uh, I also hold Andy Basevich in very high regard, and that was a second reason why I accepted this invitation. I think Andy's work is extremely important, and I hope that you will um, spend some time reading it. Um, I prepared my remarks in a certain way, and that was to respond to Andy. Um, he's a very forceful presenter, uh, and Martin's done a very good job in presenting the argument. So my job here was to um, follow him and to try to add a little value, with the purpose being to generate some conversation. So um, let me try. I'm going to make three basic points that I hope will open some things up. Um, there's something prophetic about this book, Washington Rules, uh, as well as uh, other writings that Andy Basevich has given us. Prophetic suggests certain things. It begins with the fam familiar idea of speaking truth to power, the idea that someone has to call him as he sees him, damn the consequences. There's no waffling, no preserving of one's own position in some hierarchy, no spinning or tailoring the message to gain favor in any particular quarter. A prophet can see the future, and it is his unhappy job to tell the king and the people the truth. There's trouble ahead. This prophetic theme led me to read this book as a Jeremiad, the latest in a long series of distinctly American Jeremiads. The Jeremiad is, a, is classically defined as a prolonged complaint or a tale of woe. The Jeremiad gets its name from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. As you may recall, Jeremiah's message was to lament the sad state of affairs that his, was his duty to report the Israelites had lost their way, worshiping false gods, idols, and the like. But Jeremiah's lamentations were not just venting. They had a purpose. 
the complaints were offered out of conviction and love, and they were meant to emphasize the possibilities for repentance, reform, and ultimate redemption. This form of cultural criticism became integral to American life from as early as the sermons and narratives of the first Puritan settlers. The theme became familiar trope, and we can see and hear its pattern today in more secular forms. We have strayed. We've broken the original covenant, but we can change our ways. We have the power within us to do so. We just have to see how we have strayed from the original ideal and then make up our minds to choose a different path. So Andy, and in, in this conversation, I think we are working here within the context of a well-known tradition, and this should be reassuring. One of the great strengths of our country, and perhaps its greatest strength over time, has been its capacity for self-correction. The message of the book, if I read it correctly, is not to argue for a radical new vision for America's role in the world. It is rather to argue for a radical recommitment to the original principles as he understands them. My first point then is that I see this work as a successful American Jeremiah. We could talk about others who have plowed this field and evaluate their influence, leaving aside the early practitioners like John Winthrop and Jonathan Edwards, we could look at 20th century Americans, like Randolph Bourne, he who coined the phrase, war is the health of the state, and Reinhold Niebuhr, as David Brooks puts it, the man who reminds us, quote, not to be intoxicated with our own goodness. Whatever you think of these historic figures and their various messages, it seems evident that we are at another legitimate Jeremiah moment. My second point is to highlight the profound nature of the point made in the book about our acceptance of the state of semi-war. On the surface, this point may seem banal, merely confirming the obvious fact of continuing military conflict. But like the famous Henry James mystery story, where the key piece of evidence is present throughout the narrative, the evidence is hidden in plain sight, I, think, I often think that the key facts of our national security debates are indeed hidden in plain sight. As Andy points out, we have drifted from the Cold War to the long war on global terrorism, thereby accepting a state of permanent war. We have allowed the apparatus of the national security state to be redirected almost seamlessly to two new projects, a global war on terrorism, and the lead role in guaranteeing global security. And he tells this story with all the color and drama it deserves. So here at the US Naval War College, I can't help ask some basic questions of strategy for these newest forms of permanent war that we are pursuing. Who exactly is our enemy in the so-called long war? Is it Al-Qaeda? Or does the enemy extend to additional radical groups? Is there a defined theater of conflict, a defense perimeter that we are seeking to secure? Is there a time frame? And when it comes to global security, how do we define our objectives and when will we know when we have achieved them? If we can't answer these questions with precision, we have serious strategic problems. So this college has produced great American strategists, and I think it's up to those of you who work and study here to spend some time on these questions. Now, as the book points out, we have not asked and answered additional basic questions, such as, why do we hang on to Cold War relics, such as a nuclear strategy that equates deterrence with overkill? Why do we accept a defense budget that surpasses all nations by so many levels of magnitude? As Tom Brokaw has pointed out in some of his recent commentary, why have we built a defense force that has 1% of the population doing 100% of the fighting? And so on. Some of these questions are not totally new, 
even if they are newly relevant. That most radical of presidents, Dwight Eisenhower, contributed his thoughts on this topic of permanent war exactly 50 years ago in his often cited farewell address. This seems like an apt moment to revisit that speech. Acknowledging that, quote, and I'm quoting President Eisenhower, we face a hostile ideology, global in scope, atheistic in character, ruthless in purpose, and insidious in method, he granted that the conflict might, quote, be indefinite in duration. However, his main point, and I quote again, the conjunction of an immense military establishment and a lar large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved, so it is the very structure of our society. And then Eisenhower delivered the phrase that still echoes, quote, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist, end of quote. Eisenhower raised the possibility that our society has been restructured in such a way as to accept permanent war. Inertia leads us to continue doing what we are doing. The result he feared is that we, endanger, we are in danger of losing our freedoms, the purpose of America. Now before leaving Eisenhower and his speech, let me mention just one other passage worth reflecting on. As he talked about the challenges ahead, the outgoing president observed, and I quote, as we peer into society's future, we, you and I, and our government, must avoid the temptation to live only for today, plundering for, for our own convenience, the precious resources of tomorrow. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without asking the loss of their political and spiritual heritage. We want democracy to survive for all generations to come, not to become the insolvent phantom of tomorrow, end of quote. Eisenhower, in 1961, was very uncomfortable with the status quo. Even in the depths of the Cold War, he saw the problem of indefinite war turning into permanent war, thereby affecting the liberties of the common man and reneging on our responsibilities to future generations. He also saw the looming threat of insolvency. He did not want peace and prosperity, the slogan of every aspiring leader, to turn into permanent war and insolvency, as Andy Bacevich describes in his book. The third point I want to raise with you concerns the idea already hinted at that U.S. national security policy today has become enmeshed with global security. Because our current credo, what Bacevich calls the credo, the, the purpose of America as the redeemer state, to make the world safe for democracy and so on. And our trinity, he describes the trinity as our global presence, our global power projection, and our penchant for interventionism. Because of this purpose and this method, it is now not possible for us to disentangle national security from global security. The two have become one. And so, as Andy tells us, our purpose, the American purpose, has expanded to save, liberate, transform the world. At a minimum, our purpose now is also to provide basic security at the global level. We are now the global 911. We are policing the seas, dealing with tyrants, ensuring global order. In doing so, 
we now see as our minimum duty many capacities that exceed self-defense. Now, Basevich objects, thinking this is bad strategy on several grounds. As he puts it, overexertion leads to bankruptcy, not to mention self-righteous bouts of unctuous rhetoric. All of this is counterproductive, if only because it is unsustainable. And by the way, it's also immoral. Imperialism is a betrayal, according to Basevich, of the founding ideals of our republic. Founded as an anti-imperial project, the US has become an empire. Now perhaps we drifted into this role. It's debatable how we got here. But what seems undebatable is that we have now chosen empire over republic. And so, according to Andy's argument, we need a new credo or purpose and a new trinity or strategy. Understood. But my question is, how do we shift away from our current paradigm and current reality of providing some modicum of global security? How do we recalibrate our global security duties, especially when the global system depends so much upon us and competitors like China might upset the status quo? The conservative commentator Max Boot puts the challenge this way, and that's just a brief quote from Max Boot. U.S. defense spending remains far higher than China's, and our defense capabilities remain far greater than China's or anyone else's. But our commitments are also much greater. We have to worry about Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, China, North Korea, Yemen, Somalia, Al-Qaeda, and myriad other current or potential threats, while China can devote all of its might to the Western Pacific. We will be hard pressed to resist Chinese designs for regional dominance when our Navy has only 287 ships, down 45% from 1991 when it had 529 ships, and is still shrinking. That's the end of the quote. To put it simply, to redefine national security, we will need to come up with altern alternate scenarios for global security. It seems unlikely, even from a narrow national security perspective, that we can abandon some significant contribution to global security arrangements. So then we might begin by asking what kinds of cooperative arrangements, arrangements based on mutual self-interest, are possible to respond to the challenge like the one Mac Boot, Max Boot describes? What kind of burden sharing is possible? Who would do it and how? It seems like these are questions that would need to be answered first before it would be wise to retreat from our current role of providing stability in key areas of instability. I'd like to hear more about what our new trinity should be, if indeed we are to reject global presence, global power, and periodic intervention. What are our core vital interests? What forces are necessary to protect them? What kinds of capabilities should our forces have? What doctrine should prevail? I ask about the future of global security with two specific concerns in mind. First, we live in a globalized world that challenges us morally. Globalization is not just a buzzword anymore. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the money we spend, the clothes we wear, the information we receive, all are part of global systems. We need stable, predictable global order for these systems to operate reasonably well. There's nowhere to hide, and it is indeed in our national interests to see that certain global public goods are maintained. This is especially true when it comes to the area of natural resources, whether it is conservation, climate change, access to commodities, national security is becoming intertwined with natural security. Second, security itself is changing in important ways. It seems as though the industrial wars of the 20th century are evolving into quite different types of conflict in the 21st. 
we will have to think deeply about the best ways to secure ourselves. It's hard to imagine that we will need the same configurations of battle groups, ICBMs, and the like. While force will always be necessary, overwhelming force at times, I would argue that the future of war will require many new ways of thinking about conflict itself, as well as what is required to win it. It is possible that concepts of self-defense and national security might evolve into something that looks more like cooperative policing than serial military campaigns. Is it possible that we have seen some of the limits of what kinetic force can achieve? I think these questions at least need to be asked. The real weight of ethics is in granting and withdrawing of legitimacy. Let's remember that the mitigation and cessation of evil practices ultimately comes from the assertion of core values. The end of slavery began with various revolutions and rebellions, yet the source of its ultimate demise was its loss of moral legitimacy. Communism, for the most part, ended in a similar fashion. The Soviet Union collapsed when the values that held it together were no longer credible and sustainable. Its legitimacy evaporated. The same could be said of apartheid South Africa, and maybe this is what's happening in Egypt today. We have seen more regime change in recent years because of the power of principles rather than the power of the gun. It will not be easy to get off the path of permanent war, but the first step will be acceptance that we are there. If we get beyond denial, then we have to decide if this is indeed what we really want to do to get off this path. But don't underestimate this first step. Many may not agree. But finally, if the country does decide a change is necessary, then the real work begins. And I think Andy's contribution is a great place to start. Thank you. Let me start, uh, Joel, by asking you about the Athenians. Okay. Um, the, the Athenians got themselves into this spot sort of the way we did. They uh, started off with a defensive alliance against a big power, mm -hmm. um, the Persians. Um, they won, surprisingly, some victories against that power. They emerged from that conflict with the Voluntary Alliance, the Delian League. Mm -hmm. And within 50 years, they'd created a bizarre sort of free rider problem. Mm -hmm. They had lots of a tributary states who were very unhappy to be part of the empire and no longer necessarily saw it as desirable or necessary. Um, on the other hand, they they not kept the original deal of sending ships and men. At this point, they were content, if they had to do anything, just to pay tribute and let the Athenians run the empire for them. Right. Um, and the Athenians never got themselves out of the box. In fact, they just kept expanding it, as you well know culminating in the decision to go to Sicily, which the wise military commander, Nicias, said was a really bad idea. And if you've got to go there at all, he said, let's just sail around the island, show our power, and go home. Um, but you know, Alcibiades said, no, no, that's just a stop, a stop wink on the way to Carthage, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, uh, to eternity and beyond. Right. So <laughs> um, the Athenians destroyed themselves by their inability to get themselves out of the free rider problem. Right. Uh, and that eventually caused them not even to be able to let tributary states leave the alliance because that they viewed as too destabilizing for them. So how good is that analogy, do you think? I, um, I think it's an excellent analogy. I think there are two structural problems um, that you mentioned. Um, the first is a, a classic collective action problem, um, which is um, if, we're, if we think about the provision of global security in some way, um, and the sense that the United States is um, bearing a disproportionate amount of the burden. We have free riders. Um, I think the, as I suggested in my comments, the one way out is to be thinking about alternative arrangements yeah. that, would, that would address that. The other structural problem is a long-term, short-term problem. Um, this idea of uh, we don't seem to have the institutional capacity to, to think seriously about the longer-term future and the fact of mm -hmm. sort of the unsustainable nature of the, 
position was? Well, part of their problem was they were stuck in, in their own self-image, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they would say to themselves, how can you not love us? Didn't we defeat the Persians for you 50 years ago? Right. How can you not be grateful to us now yeah. and permanently into the future? Uh, and I think they seriously believed this and were genuinely baffled that other Greeks thought that was then, this is now. Right. Well, yeah, and this um, comes to another, another familiar theme for realists, classical realists, um, which is this idea of some sense of the limits of power, what power can achieve, and also some sense of humility. Um, you know, I mentioned one of my favorite um, phrases that people use to describe the, the, the importance of Reinhold Niebuhr uh, and Niebuhr's uh, suggestion that, uh, you know, we shouldn't love ourselves so much. Uh, let's not fool ourselves that we're as virtuous as we think we are. So I think this idea of um, self-awareness and self-recognition is very important. Yeah. Um, okay, well, as, we, as I said at the beginning, this is obviously a fairly high strategic level of conversation, so uh, not necessarily at the same level of talking about the profession itself, but these places exist precisely to help uh, our nation develop strategic leaders. Um, a couple of, we had the joke about the Congress this morning, and the world would be a better place, one might argue, if politicians had a war college to go to to, <laughs> to think about these problems. But they, um, they are them, and you are you. And so, um, to some degree, this kind of strategic thought, if it's happening at all, is happening at academic institutions and uh, war colleges and not much else. So, what are your thoughts? I mean, this is a question you'll be thinking about, again, as I said this morning, as you think about future Navy force structure, the question that we had about that. Uh, De decreasing budgets. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think we really no kidding need if there are very constrained budgets to work with? Uh, what is the diplomatic piece of this? Um, I remember once at the, at the Army War College, um, we were doing the big war game exercise that came at the end, and uh, we taught all year about the many as instruments of national power. And so the guy who was the leader of the, the war game decided, I think we should try to solve this problem diplomatically. The whole game came to a screeching halt because the, in all the computer scenarios assumed we were going to fight a war. Uh, they were all preloaded for what deployment decisions you were going to make. And uh, they had to, the game controllers had to reach and say, no, no, you can't go that way because it would ruin the game. Right. Uh, we're, we're, we're locked into going down this route. So uh, did this stimulate anybody's thoughts about anything? I'd like to hear, hear them. Please. Yes. Major Dave, uh, Dr. Cook. First, sir, for you, just a comment. I, I think you actually validated that the junior course probably needs to include Thucydides in our uh, <laughs> Every course should include it. Thucydides. <laughs> um, the, the question, though, is this. I can't help but notice in coupling this discussion and, and uh, Dr. Basevich's comments with the earlier discussion that we had today that there seems to be the possibility of a paradox between the idea of a military profession and, and this idea of drawing back from, from where that kind of idea has got us towards. And I'd ask you to, to discuss that a little bit if you could, sir, or gentlemen, because if indeed we are a profession, then there, there is that, in coupling that with the essence found in each of those cultures, the Navy, the, the Army, and take them what you will, there's that inherent drive to, to prove your, your reason, the interest, so to speak, and, and that, in this case, is war. So it kind of goes against what Dr. Basevich's yeah. argument is. So how do we, yeah. how do we marry that, that kind of seeming paradox? That's a great and many-faceted question. So let, let me uh, deal with it. Well, let's go back to the founders, right? The founders' idea was you'd get by with citizen soldiers, right? That if you needed the war, you would mobilize, either mobilize the militias or you, uh, or, uh, to, federal, to federalize the militias or you would tr raise it, train and equip an army in fairly short notice, and then use that army to conduct whatever military operations you wanted, and then to demobilize at the end of it down to practically nothing. Now, it's important to remember that that is in fact what we did until the end of World War II. Right, so, uh, again, I'm not a historian, but I, uh, if you ask yourself, what, were the, what was the military profession? Did the military profession exist? Did professional officers exist? between World War I and World War II? Yes, but in very small numbers, right? Uh, 
And what were they doing? I mean, uh, Eisenhower was running the Civilian Conservation Corps out in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, uh, later, he persuaded the War Department to buy him some leftover French tanks from World War I that he could drive around in the countryside of New Jersey to figure out if we ever had a war and we ever had some tanks, what would we do with them, right? So they were still doing professional stuff, right? They were trying to think about the next war. We learned about the importance of armor in the last war. We do need to experiment with this and so forth. But it, it was very small and it was very, and they went to school a lot, right? I mean, uh, you know, Patton and Eisenhower were out at Leavenworth, you know, going to school, reading, thinking, uh, developing this stuff. So you can have a, a, a professional force that is not ready to go, right? That's not, re that's not ready to fight, but which is still studying the problem. Now, I think Snyder's point this morning was quite right. The American people would not settle for a, an amateur force, a citizen army, any longer, because the measure is effectiveness, right? And we got into the standing military establishment of Eisenhower for, for two reasons, really. One was uh, on the nuclear side, the Cold War, obviously, which re required perpetual readiness, but also on the Army side, the sort of mantra of no more task force Smiths, right? Uh, the, the real story of that, I guess, is more complicated than the Army myth about it, but the Army myth about it is, you know, what happened to the forces sent into Korea, which were basically occupation forces in Japan uh, that took quite a mauling at the beginning, proves that you've got to be ready to go uh, on much shorter notice for a conventional operation as well, right? So those two factors created the large standing strategic force and then uh, the standing uh, professional force. Um, so, one answer is it could be a lot smaller and could not necessarily be weaponized to go to war right away and still be doing very professional things, right? Um, that would be an option. Um, did I lose the rest of it? I think maybe that's all I've got. Well, I, um, I, no, I would just add, too, um, a theme of the book is this idea of what you mentioned before, Martin, about the militarization of foreign policy. And the idea is, um, you know, because we have these capabilities that we use them um, and use them perhaps more than we should. Yeah. And that there's sort of almost an ethos of, you know, uh, moving into a, a certain kind of militarism. Yeah, and, and um, let me elaborate on that. I mean, you know, in traditional just war, one of the criteria of legitimate war ad bellum is that war be the last resort, right? Now, I've argued in print a few places. It seems to me historically that came from two different sources. One was a moral reason, which is that killing people and breaking things is on the face of it morally undesirable if you don't have a good reason to do it. But the other reason was you're going to get a lot of your own people killed, right? So part of your fiduciary responsibility to your own forces is not to commit them mistakenly. You know, as, as, um, as the soldiers say in Shakespeare's Henry V, you know, if the cause be not, be not just, it's a black mark for the king that led them to it, right? Um, for that discussion. Now, Dr. Lucas will talk about this more tomorrow, but as we develop more and more high-tech weapon systems, as we're able to conduct at least conventional military operations more and more asymmetrically, it, it reduces that second component of last resort considerably, right? So uh, uh, it's understandable that if you have military capability that's readily available to you, which you can use with apparent impunity, uh, the threshold will go down. Now, I think we've begun to see that this imperative impunity only is true if we view the situation through a pretty narrow lens, right? If, if you start seeing what are the long-term consequences of using a mili right. American military power, which is at first glance extremely successful because of the extreme disparity in capability, right. it comes back to bite us in other asymmetrical ways, right? And I, I don't mean to be justifying what the uh, asymmetrical attacks are doing, but it's a rational response, right, to, to the disparity in force structure b between potential adversaries and us. So we shouldn't be surprised when people act rationally. Please, Jim. Uh, Jim Ellsworth, Naval War College faculty. Uh, it seems to me that one of the things that the conversation has omitted largely up to this point, is what you just sort of brushed up against, and that's the enemy gets a vote. And the enemy has chosen uh, a state of perpetual war until, you know, as long as there is one more person, one person devoted to our cause to strap on a suicide vest, 
We, the war doesn't end until American power is erased from the earth. Well, and Jim. As long uh, as that's the case, uh, we are faced with a situation where the rest of this starts to come into play. The rest of the world, looking at our performance in the Cold War, looking at our performance in Desert Storm, I would argue has essentially subcontracted, outsourced global security to its most effective provider, the United States, and has committed to funding that. And this is what, where I question the sustainability piece of it. Uh, whether they would, would acknowledge it in these terms or not through a mechanism that they call, we call, debt. But is not truly debt for as long as it can't possibly be, call, uh, be called due without causing the entire system, including their system, to collapse around them. And so I would, would ask you, uh, is it possible that something fundamental has shifted here? Uh, where the circumstances we face are one in which this is a rational response and our ethical obligation as custodians of the system, the global system uh, that we have created, uh, is to take responsibility for it. Yeah. I think if I, were, if I could channel Basevich, he would say, you just uh, eloquently articulated the consensus I'm telling you we should get past. Um, that, um, that viewed from one lens, everything you said is true. Viewed from another lens, why, is, why, is, why does Al-Qaeda exist? Because American forces, because the US CIA created it uh, to, to operate in Afghanistan, and then the fact that we were in Saudi Arabia became the reason for them to continue to exist, if you read Bin Laden's first fatwa. So, you know, basically would tell you, it's the fact that we're all over the world that is creating the enemies. Well, now, it's a myth, now. The fact that the police are in the community is what's creating the, the criminals. Well, the truth is, of course, it's, it's complex and it's a little of everything, right? The truth is it's complex and it's a little of everything. But um, I think he would at least urge us to not be locked into only one paradigm of explanation. Anyone else? Hand up over here. Over here. Yeah. Hey, sir, uh, Matt Rasmussen, U.S. Army. Dr. Rodenthal said something about uh, having an institutional capacity for long-term planning. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we talked about in this last trimester was do democracies have the ability to strategize? Because government changes so often, and how can you have a continual policy? Um, political leadership keeps changing, and policies, so they have to change their strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we get that? One thought I had was, okay, if we can't be good at strategizing, maybe we need to be better at reassessing the situation, you know, adapting to a situation as it comes up. So we can't make something happen, we have to be better at reacting to our adaptive enemy, uh, which I think also to go back to the uh, earlier point about are you professionally negligent if you don't keep up with uh, oh, You also have to consider that you're fighting somebody who is fighting you. So uh, that don't, I think that gets back to you. But how do we get that institutional capability? Is it through better intelligence? Is it better adaptability? Because um, I think that's the root of the problem versus making alliances to let other people do the work. Mm -hmm. Well, just an answer to your question about um, obligations to the future or mid to long, long term planning. Part of it is just a question of sustainability. So you would think that any leader would have concern for the sustainability of the institution that they're, they're part of. That should be part of their ethic in a way. Um, but the institutional problem is there's nobody sitting around the table whose job it is is to sort of speak for, you know, I'm, I'm the voice from 10 years from now, you know. Um, I'm not so sure that there are um, sort of institutional fixes or revisions that can be made. I think it goes more to um, the, the values of those that are in position to make decisions and that this has to be seen as an interest, um, an important interest in sort of the enlightened self-interest um, of, the, of, the, of the organization or the institution. Um, and we, um, and I think that's what Eisenhower was saying. I don't think Eisenhower was saying that, um, you know, we need to, to restructure the entire uh, 
uh, military industrial complex, whatever, but he said the people that are running it have to be mindful of it and they have to be mindful of their obligations to the future and act accordingly. Well, right, and, and that's, uh, again, we've referred to the speech so much, perhaps we should have just put it up. It's not that, all that long, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, an, on, it's very much an, on the one hand, on the other sort of speech. I mean, he says, look, I recognize that the rise of this military industrial complex is, isn't going to be necessary. He says, you know, in the past, we had big industries that would, when necessary, convert to war production, but they would then revert to civilian production in peacetime, and we wouldn't have a permanent armaments industry. Uh, that, that was the norm. And so now that's not going to be the case anymore. It is going to become the norm. Um, and that's, that's going to be necessary. He grants that. But then he goes through this whole list of what that threatens, and his only solution is an, an alert and critical populace mm -hmm. that watches this like a hawk, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. I think what Andy would tell you is that was, uh, that was a Nice hope in 1961, but what 50 years have taught us is we don't have that alert and watchful populace. So um, it, we don't have it. So if, if that's not going to be the break on it, the only other break on it is to actually dismantle it, or at least cut it way back. Mm -hmm. back. Oh, on the back. Can't see, but the lights are very bright. So. This guy's good. Mark Zimmer, make the SMC. Question for you. Eisenhower, his budget at the time was about 10% of national GDP. Ours is less than four. What would he say about the threat of a military industrial complex now compared to the entire entitlement industrial complex now as a risk for our future well being? Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, the whole structure of the economy, of course, is fundamentally different now than it was then. Most, most of the entitlement programs didn't exist. And as, as you well know, if you look at only discretionary spending, Defense is a big piece of it, but the vast bulk of the total budget are these fixed entitlements, um, as you certainly know. And so I think the budget arguments we're about to see in the Congress are, are those things touchable or aren't they touchable? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. But you're, you're, if your point is that he was working in a very different economic situation where defense was a bigger chunk of the, of the total um, income of the country, but we weren't thinking about spending it in the enti entitlement programs, you're certainly right. Please. So, Lieutenant Commander Scott Larson, uh, just wanted to, I don't know if this is a question or maybe just a comment, and perhaps you gentlemen can weigh in with some of your thoughts, but uh, I obviously haven't uh, read a great deal of Basevich, but I'm curious as to what is the alternative state. In other words, okay, is the hypothesis that we pull back uh, we don't go everywhere, we don't have this omnipresent uh, force, and all of a sudden, you know, stability, greater stability ensues. Uh, our position uh, or our perception others have of us around the globe is enhanced. We become more secure because I would submit that we have too much to lose, that there's too much at stake for us to really indulge in that kind of an experiment. Uh, and I would also contend that from a Navy standpoint, I can't speak to the other services because it's what I know, but I know that we spend a considerable amount of our time and resources, particularly in the Fifth Fleet AOR, engaging with other countries, uh, security cooperation, building partner capacity so that they can defend their own coast, interdict their own bad guys enforce their own maritime laws. And I know the Navy has made it part of their cooperative maritime strategy that one of our main goals is to prevent wars. So I'm just not sure that Lisevich is, whatever he is ultimately proposing is, is viable. And uh, I'd just like to maybe get some of your thoughts on those, those comments. Well, th uh, thank you for those comments. And my, I have very similar questions to yours. Um, I think that um, my questions would be, what, yes, what would the alternate arrangements be? I do think that the base of each view is quite stark, which is a, a, a real retreat. Um, I think at one point he says the primary duty station for the American soldier is the United States, right? He, he's, he argues against global presence, um, the idea of, of power projection, um, presence, uh, global 
presence, global power projection, and interventionism. Um, my sense is that he would be exploring these ideas of cooperative security arrangements, um, trying to get toward the free rider problem. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, if you take the real long view of American history, remember George Washington's farewell address warned it, don't get yourself in entangling alliances. You know, um, you know just, just be yourselves. And of course, you could get away with that because, you know, you were a, a continental power in effect. Well, not in his time, but we were on our way to becoming, a continent, and it had big oceans around you, and the other powers were a long ways away, and uh, the, the economy wasn't globalized. And so all those things qualify it considerably. Right. I, I think Andy would say, um, you know, it's, it's the old thing about if all you've got is a hammer, right? Um, so if you had fewer hammers, you'd have to find other solutions to some of these problems, mm -hmm. uh, like diplomatic ones. I mean, Joel made the point very clearly that, you know, um, just economically, we have globalized interests. Um, and short of ruining the economy, those are going to stay there. Now, does it follow that the only way to make sure that that globalized economy works is by having the military instrument of power readily available all over the globe? Well, maybe, but I don't think it's obvious that that's true. Um, I mean, just a quick contrary to fact conditional. I mean, after 9-11, if you, if you remember the mood of the world after 9-11 toward the United States, uh, I mean, it was just amazing, the amount of goodwill. Uh, uh, and in unusual places, you know, Pakistan, India. I, mean, I was in Norway a few weeks after 9-11, and you couldn't get near the American embassy. It was like 200 feet of flowers around the American embassy. So, I mean, where I thought things were going to go is we probably were going to have to take direct action against al-Qaeda in the camps, but then it would be largely a diplomatic uh, cooperative arrangement to say, look, uh, I mean, al-Qaeda, in a bizarre, perverse way, did us a favor that they attacked lots of people, not just us. So it became readily apparent that Indonesians and, and Australians and, uh, and, and, and Spain and all of these places had an equal problem with this kind of terrorism. Therefore, the objective requirement was for considerable international cooperation at all levels, not just militarily, but diplomatically, intelligence sharing, policing, and so forth. And obviously we did some of that, but we also spent a lot of political capital on going to wars that a few of our allies thought were good ideas. Um, so you want to play what if history, you could say, well, what if we'd played it differently? What if we'd said, well, no, we really need to move forward with this international uh, engagement about this? I think Andy would say things like that if I, uh, I, don't, I hate to speak for him, but I think that's what he'd say. Um, John, what's uh, causes view? 1400 to dismiss? Okay. All right, well, the, the end is very close, 20 minutes away, but if, if there are questions, I know I'm standing between you and driving home in the snow, so. Uh, yes, one, one. Yes, sir, Brian Durant. So, perhaps there's been a fundamental paradigm shift, and my best example would be France. France looked at Chad and Sudan, and they said, the world has tried to do good things, and it has been ineffective. And this is not the French military who said, let's go to Sudan, let's go to Chad, let's make things better. It was the French people who went to their government and said, we need to do something. Now the paradigm shift is, is we see these things on TV. Uh, you can't get away from seeing these types of things. And yes, our solution is our hammer, but it is a very effective hammer. And our hammer can hit anywhere in the world anytime it wants to. So why is that something that we should shrink from? Why not go forward and try to benefit other cultures? and benefit those people that are in need? Yeah, really good question. I think, I mean, here, here's, the, here's the problem as I see it. Um, if you take the conventional political divides of the US, you know, the consensus is we want to use military power. The difference between the parties is how, right? So uh, somewhat stereotypically, Republicans tend to want to talk about using hard power for military and direct conflict kind of reasons, regime change and so forth. And generally speaking, the left wants to use military power for humanitarian purposes, right? Uh, so they'll see something on television, say someone should do something about that, and then who's the somebody turns into it should be the US military. Problem is, that sentiment, while sincere, is relatively shallow. Uh, and so if the problem turns out to be a hard problem, or the casualties on our side turn out to be extensive, we don't tend to have the political staying power for it. So I think basically what you would argue, 
you know, to, to take an example like um, Somalia, you know, I mean, you go in with the best of motives, you're trying to do something humanitarian, then you get entangled in local politics, then you take casualties, then the pressure politically is to come home, right? Or take the, the way President Clinton chose to prosecute the Kosovo campaign from, from the air only, and he did that for a calculated political reason, that I, I want to do this for humanitarian reasons, but I believe that I can only sustain it politically if I don't have casualties. Um, so, you know, you got to think through not just that first impulse to use, to use the hammer, as you said, but how long are you willing to keep using the hammer, and, and especially as the hammer gets more expensive in lives and treasure, and are you going to end up running out of support to, for using the hammer before you fixed any problem? And then you have to ask yourself, well, was there a net benefit or not? I, mean, I don't know. Often it turns out to be that perverse, I think, as it plays out. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Andy would go further, though. He would say it's not the purpose of America to save or tr liberate or transform the world. That's not the purpose of the Union. Right. I mean, it's right. a very strong view of that. He says at one point, the purpose of America is to be America. Right. Uh, but, now, mm -hmm. it, you know, that said, I, I'm not totally there with him. But in terms of what then are our, our humanitarian duties, um, given the capacities that we have, um, and that's an interesting question. So what capacities should we build? What are sustainable? And what then should those duties be? But then again, we have this free rider problem. I mean, why, why should it be the United States the only, the only power that has these capacities to do this? Why aren't others at least doing their share um, to form some kind of collective action for basic humanitarian functions? I mean, I think it would be interesting to have that conversation and see if there can be progress made in that way. Also, um, you know, invoking Ronald Niebuhr one more time, you know, we should always be a little bit skeptical of our own goodness, you know, do we, how, how often is it that we act purely in an altruistic way? Um, generally speaking, we have mixed motives. And when we use force, um, yes, we sometimes use it in ways that we think um, save, liberate, transform, and so on. Um, but let's not get, <coughs> get carried away in terms of why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, uh, listen, for tomorrow morning, um, Dr. Lucas is already here, so our speaker for the morning is here. So just pay, uh, pay attention to the weather calls, and uh, whenever we start, we will start uh, with George's presentation. Uh, I really appreciate your flexibility. I, I apologize for the weather. If I could do better, I would. Uh, and uh, hope to see you all tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. If I can have your attention real quick, uh, the Chief of Staff asked me to make a quick announcement. If you haven't been outside since this morning, there's about a quarter of an inch of ice on 